Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hi, everyone. I'm Francesca Maxime, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Rerooted Podcast here on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network, where we're really trying to reroute ourselves into that which is natural of the earth, from the earth, as we all are, and find that reconnection. And I have to say that as we tape here at the end of March, we are in the middle of um, the global pandemic, which is sort of highlighting in many ways this idea of interdependence, this idea of uh, everyone and everything um, having uh, in, you know, Buddhist and mindfulness terminology is sort of this basis of causes and conditions and that we're all sort of in this systemic um, balance or in this uh, sort of way of being where, you know, things influence one another. And how did we come to be into the situation that we are now and all of the different factors that are at play now and kind of maybe what are the roots of that? Where did that come from? What are some of the, the systems? What are some of the structural issues? Um, you know, what may have begot um, our situation in some ways into things that include things like the kind of a situation that we're in now in terms of the pandemic? And I say this because the emphasis from this podcast for the last several months has really been on structural issues and systemic issues, often having to do with um, social inequality or social inequities, racial inequities. Uh, and, you know, my mentor, Jack Hornfield, talks a lot about greed. And, and, and the Buddhist teaching was a lot about, you know, craving, that desire, desire, craving, and also aversion, like, oh, no, I don't want any of that, can't have that. Or even, you know, ignorance, the lack of clear seeing, the inability to kind of see what's actually here, be with what's actually here. And that the path, you know, uh, that really sort of the Noble Eightfold Path is a way to recognize suffering, find a way to sort of recognize what the narrative around our suffering is, and then find a way through, find a way to actually walk through it. And mindfulness is one of those components, but so are things like ethical living, sort of morality, you know, balance and equanimity. How do we, how do we actually um, incorporate these things into our daily life in a very sort of applied way, given that <clears throat> we are so interdependent as we're seeing now? And so we're going to revisit the conversation on social inequities and racialized trauma and sort of what it is to have this sort of bedrock, if you will, socially of a sort of more top-down kind of power over as, a, as opposed to empowered with kind of idea, which I think is very um, common in our Western world. And, and, and what, what, what comes from that? Uh, clearly, we've seen lots of profits, you know, corporate-wise that come from that, uh, sometimes some promotions and things like that that are personally uh, satisfying to certain families, but also what's excluded or what's left out from that. So that's just sort of my take on where we are right now in terms of the intro to my guest today, uh, Robin Mallison Alpern. She is the director of training at the Center for the Study of White American Culture, CSWAC. Uh, their website is euroamerican.org. We'll talk more about that later. Raised in the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers, uh, Robin has had a lifelong concern for racial justice and equity. Her anti-racist activism has taken a variety of forms, including the study of books, films, and lectures, taking part in workshops, seminars, and trainings, publishing essays, articles, and reports, public speaking, community organizing, and more. She's worked with several anti-racism organizations in her hometown and in the Quaker community, and uh, includes mixed race groups and also white caucus groups, so really sort of um, across the board. Uh, she's raised four kids who teach her every day how to make the world a better place to live. I don't doubt that. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining us here on the Rerooted Podcast. 
You're welcome. And thank you, Francesca, again for inviting me. And um, I want to quick say that I do work with the Center for the Study of White American Culture. Just want to get that out there in front because it's quite a mouthful. And um, we have found over our 25 years of existence, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary next month. Um, we found that uh, often just the name of our organization, the Center for the Study of White American Culture can bring up a lot for people. So since you said the name, I just wanted to mention, you know, that sometimes people go, oh my God, must be white supremacists, right? But um, that's actually part of what our teaching is about, is that um, it's essential that folks who are working for racial justice have an understanding about whiteness and how whiteness plays a part. And so we, we need to have a lot more learning. Even though white people are always in the center, there's a way that, uh, you know, they have that saying about the fish doesn't see the water. So in the same way, whiteness can be invisible and therefore operating in the background in a really malicious way. In a very prominent way, but still in a background kind of a way. Exactly. Um, yeah, I was using that analogy the other day about the fish in a way, but I was like, you know, what about the giraffes? The fish are saying, why aren't you a fish? Or what about the monkeys? Why aren't you a fish? Or what do you mean? And, you know, we're all fish. We're here in the bowl. We have water. It's fine. And I'm like, yeah, well, there's other people that have a different reality and they're also on the same planet and they're also cohabitating in a way. So how can we learn to better recognize that we are unique, but that we all are um, you know, living, breathing beings that, that need to have our needs met and that that's okay. And uh, Yeah, and when you say that, that, that we all need to live and breathe, uh, what I find as a white person who works hard to work with and educate other white people about racism, I know that a lot of white people are very afraid of that work because we feel like we're going to get blamed and shamed and dumped on and maybe worse. And it's not about that. Um, it's not that, you know, white people are evil or our culture is the devil or something like that. Yeah, we have a lot of problems in our culture and maybe we'll get into some of that, maybe not. But, um, you know, we, we are a form of humanity, uh, those of us who identify as white. And the problem is not white, people or even white culture, the problem is that when that becomes dominant, when it becomes the only way to be, the best way, the normal, when it becomes the water to all of the fish who are not all white, and yet they're all supposed to swim in that same water, that's, that's when it's a problem. Right, right, right. Yeah. And as, you, as I hear you say that again, back to the mindfulness teachings or the Buddhist teachings of like, you know, it's not the desire is bad. It's that the craving, that insatiability piece is bad in much the same way that supremacy of any sort means that nobody else can win. There's one winner. There's one little piece of pie at the top and everyone has to be climbed over or excluded or done better on in order to, to do that. And that there could be another way. There is this other way of being that is more equitable. Um, yeah. So um, let's just pausing there for a moment and like getting back to precisely um, how we came to have this conversation today. Um, the, the Center for the Study of White American Culture, not a, a white supremacist organization, a, a, an organization that studies, as you were saying, really what it is, quite the opposite of that, um, understanding what it means to have a cultural identity as a white person or to not have as much of a cultural identity as you might think you do as a white person and as a white race and as a white um, group of people. And then what does that mean and what's gained and what's lost and what does it what, what does it cost to have that and maintain that and how is that done? And so the class that you're offering that's coming up is called Decentering Whiteness and Building Multiracial Community. And um, you're not personally offering it, but the center is. And I just wanted to maybe start there and um, maybe talk a little bit about um, the kind of work that that kind of class invites people to explore. Sure. So um, first I wanna mention that the mission of the Center for Study of White American Culture, I'm gonna read it just to make sure I get it right. And it's very short. Our mission, is to build an equitable society in the United States by decentering white culture and centering an anti-racist, multiracial culture free of white supremacy. 
So the, the webinar that's coming up in April is built directly out of that mission vision statement. It's the, it's the understanding that two things, in our view, two crucial things need to happen in our society. One is decentering whiteness, and we can talk a little more about what that means, but, the, but basically the idea that right now, whiteness is the predominant mainstream controlling uh, narrative and presence in our society. So decentering to move that whiteness, not, not kill it or destroy it or anything like that, but just to move it out of the center. That's one piece of the puzzle. And then the other piece, you can't just leave a hole in the center. Sociologists say that uh, society has to have a center. So the other piece is to build in the center of our society an anti-racist, multi-racial culture. So the workshop Beautiful. is going to be examining more of, uh, okay, what does all that mean? What does it look like? How can we begin to do that work? Right. And I just want to underscore this concept again of um, Resma Manikam, who I've also interviewed for this um, podcast and, and who does uh, uh, cultural somatic and, and, and racialized trauma healing work and is a somatic experiencing practitioner like me and also a psychotherapist, <clears throat> that, that he calls it white body supremacy. And, and in much the same way that I think a lot of women, uh, for example, are familiar with the term Western beauty standards, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that it's kind of more like that mm -hmm. in the idea that it's more like there is a way that people are found to be attractive and that it's through that lens only that attractiveness exists as opposed to there is a variety of different ways of people who are attractive to others and beauty is in the eye of the beholder type of thing right like my body isn't like Gwyneth Paltrow's for me to look like her try to look like her is impossible but I spent a lot of time doing that right trying to do that yeah. um, and failing miserably and then consequently feeling not good about that and so just in that way this white supremacy isn't white supremacist it's a white supremacy philosophy around that centering whiteness which is sort of the water we were talking about the invisible ether that we're all in like we haven't checked it is the idea that white is better better than brown better than asian better than indigenous better than whatever and that that shows up in conscious and unconscious ways in a variety of ways including in structural systems and including in a Buddhist teaching kind of a way, just the very conditioning, again, back to causes and conditions that we come into the world with. So even if we're a well-intentioned person, mm -hmm. we are affected by mm -hmm. what would be a centered white or a um, white supremacist philosophy. And we would then be invited to actively recognize that and where we sit in that and then come into the new center you're talking about, about building multiracial health and community. Yeah, and, and it's really important that people understand what you just said about the conditioning and the training, because um, you might make the mistake of thinking that whiteness only goes where white people are. But because it's the culture, because it, again, it's that water, everybody has been conditioned in it. And obviously people of color, different communities of color um, have, uh, their their culture um, and their traditions and history and their lives and experience to kind of counter that whiteness to some extent. But there's also an important way that that whiteness can be present even when there's no white person in the room. Yeah. Right. So so we so we all have <laughs> um, some work to do, but I would say particularly white people, since we kind of came up with whiteness, um, we especially have work to do. Right, right, right. No, I, I, I understand what you mean, and I'm not sure everyone does, but it's that idea of it's a philosophy around a certain way of doing things, which I tend to sort of think about as being um, sort of rigid, sort of more like one way, sort of less um, expansive or creative or brimming with possibilities, which is all the things that in a, in a, in a more Buddhist or mindful standpoint, we, we sort of are opening our awareness to, you know, possibility and, and, and as opposed to just sort of lock down on, on one, one road. Right. Yes. So you're using the word philosophy and I would agree that that, that would be part of what I would 
say about whiteness, but it's also, it's an ideology. So it in includes practices and beliefs and attitudes. It's, it's even more far ranging than philosophy. Um, and, and you're right, not, not, it's not always easy to grapple with um, what does whiteness mean? What is that about? Um, I wouldn't want you to like put me up against the wall and say, define that term. It's, you know, but I will say that um, some folks have done some really excellent work on fleshing that out. And that will be again, part of what will happen in the webinars, kind of getting into well, what is whiteness. But um, Tema Oaken is a white woman who has done some excellent work uh, that you can find online. She has an article called White Supremacy Culture, and by which she does not mean neo-Nazi culture. She, she means the culture we're all in that is dominated by whiteness. And she does this brilliant job of kind of breaking out what are some of the aspects of that such as what you were saying, um, the, the rigidity tends to be an aspect of white culture, uh, perfectionism, um, urgency, you've got to get it done right now, now, now. Um, and in not a lot of time. And yeah, and you don't have time, but you've got to do it anyway. And if it's not written down, it didn't happen. I mean, just a whole lot of elements that for many of us who identify as white, we look at that list and we just kind of go like, well, oh, that's just the way things are. That's just normal. <laughs> right. But it's actually white supremacy culture. It's not normal for everyone. Well, beautiful. And the reason why we know it's not normal for everyone is because we know that other cultures don't use that model and right. function well. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I want to circle back to what you were saying in your introductory remarks um, when you were talking about the rerootedness. It, it really sparked for me one of my passions in doing work for racial justice and equity is on behalf of my own self and people who are like me, other white people. You know, my, my initial early um, passion for racial justice uh, came out of a concern for the lives and the experiences and the well-being of people of color. And that is still very, very much what motivates me. It matters a lot to me how other people are faring. However, as I have grown into my anti-racism, I've also come to understand that my own well-being has to matter to me as well. And the, the health and well-being of my community has to matter to me as well. And so when you talked about rerouting, that reminded me that, um, you know, for so many of us white people, we don't even realize how narrow and restricted our lives are, how cut off we are, how limited we are to our own culture, which we keep trying to enforce on everybody else. And so, you know, it, it's part of reclaiming our humanity, as I see it, for us to decenter mm. whiteness and build multiracial community, because that allows us to be fully and wholly human again, too. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. I, I really, I really love what you're saying, and it reminds me of the um, course that uh, White Awake, uh, yes. another organization, offers. Um, around sort of understanding the roots of, um, you know, sort of how whiteness came to be and, and sort of going back to a lot of, um, well, what was given up when, you know, European ancestors had to leave, uh, you know, the commons, for example, based on economic issues. Really, to me, whiteness is about economics and it manifests yes. through race and through dominance around that. And then it further perpetuates harm and violence through economic and um, other kinds of, uh, you know, physical, um, very actualized harm, uh, including economic harm, uh, on people who are in a mar more marginalized position uh, or excluded position. But but that going back, it's like wow, look at all these things. We used to have all these like Celtic rituals. We used to have all these like Italian rituals. We used to have all these like fun, interesting ways of dressing and eating and spices and things that were really amazing. And then to come to the United States, we had to assimilate. That was the word, not acculturate, not accommodate, not make room for, or space for, and celebrate the uniqueness, but to fit in and to that degree people for, were given uniforms so they were like told to wear the same clothes 
people's like my Italian relatives, you couldn't speak the language, you know, what's your smelly food that you're eating? You should have a Wonder Bread sandwich with, you know, American cheese on it, which is about as disgusting as, <laughs> you know, if you ask me, compared to, you know, my grandfather's lasagna or something, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's so interesting to me and that the longing for that kind of richness um, is, is, is such a longing for the richness of that which is the life, the rootedness, the earthiness of life, that we have to like sanitize ourselves no pun intended, given our current environment, but we have to like sanitize ourselves to such an extent just to appear like, you know, we have no body hair, we have mm -hmm. no gray hair, mm -hmm. we have perfectly manicured nails, we have, you know, a perfect body that, you know, whatever. And that really that's not life. That's not living. That's not the organicity of our lives. Right. And I love that word that you used, longing. I, I think and I experience and I, I believe I have witnessed that um, white people as, as a collective have a profound longing for those lost origins you were talking about a moment ago. You know, even if we're, you know, 12th generation in the United States or something, back, 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 we had roots, we had cultural roots, religious roots, ethnic roots, geographic roots. We had all kinds of roots that got, as you were saying, you know, that just got eliminated, just wiped out, forgotten. And honestly, I, I think that a lot of the a genuinely crazy behavior that we see from white people, a lot of violence and um, a lot of behavior that is racist, I think that much of it stems from that trauma that we are all lying about, you know, because again, it's, it's part of our culture that we're perfect. We're good. We're, you know, we got this. Mm. We're cool, calm, and collected. That's our watchword, cool, calm, and collected. That's us. And so how could we have trauma? How could we have rootlessness? How could we be hollow inside? And yet mm. I think that many of us, if, if we really are honest with ourselves, we have this sense that, you know, I, I don't know what's at the core of me. I'm, I'm a fake, I'm, you know, I'm a fraud. We mm. have a, that sense there, probably pretty deeply buried, but I think that it's, it's there and then it turns into our horrible actions in the world. Yes, or to ourselves in the form of shame. That or too. both. Or both. Yeah. Yeah. In the sense that I feel like there's a lot of people with a lot of good energy, um, sort of a lot of white folks that I know who are well-intentioned and somehow dip into doing some of the work that's invited here with this class and kind of are overtaken by a sense of overwhelm around the enormity of what it would mean to kind of reckon with the history of, um, the way in which the United States, for example, was founded and came into being with genocide and enslaving people and, and, and the um, economic and, 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 and very impactful um, current day realities, uh, situationally, socially, for, for folks who are different races um, that are non-white, um, who continue to be marginalized as perpetuated by this systemic structure that just dipping the toe in the water of some of the work sometimes can, as you alluded to earlier, feel and evoke very um, feelings of like shame, like, gee, I, 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 I don't know, I inherited this, I, I, I feel a longing, I'm already feeling bad and disconnected and separate, and now I have to feel worse because I have to own this, but I don't know how to own this because I don't know how to hold this. So it kind of gets into a collapse and a shutdown. And then it's like, well, I don't have that energy to then come and join and meet in the center of connection to yeah. build that multi multiracial community. That's the yeah. word that you have there, which yeah. is necessarily connected. So can you talk a little bit about how the work of the center or this class or, or this phenomenon um, is in a way perpetuating violence by white silence, it's called, I think. Mm. Well, so I'm not sure if this is exactly the answer to your question, but it's what came to me as I was sure. listening to you. So um, one of the strengths of the programs that we do, and we have, we have a number of workshops um, in addition to the 
decentering whiteness that's coming up. But one of our strengths is that generally speaking, after the workshop, white people will say, wow, that felt really good. I was scared to come here. You know, I was worried about being shamed and blamed and so on. Um, and in the course of this workshop, I was allowed to be myself and celebrate who I am and at the same time face some of you know that list that you were just giving of all the things that white culture and white people are responsible for so you know this is very much our sense at the center is that white people need to come to grips with our history but not while hating on ourselves uh, you know that uh, an expression that people are using now sometimes is calling in and it's more mm -hmm. about calling in not calling out right we're calling people into community and that's only going to happen if we can respect and appreciate and love and care for one another at the same time that we are facing those hard facts mm -hmm. and i want to say for me as an individual uh, you used a word earlier on about equanimity and i think that 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 very much applies here that we need, and I'm not saying that this is easy, and I'm not saying that everybody necessarily does it gracefully or, you know, right well, out of the gate. it can be messy, but messy can be okay. Absolutely, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's no. probably, if it's real and human, it's not gonna be perfect. But we can at least know and, and hold in our understanding that there is such a thing as a, a consciousness for myself, that I am both a member of a group that is racist, the white supremacist, oppressors of people of color. I belong to that group by virtue of my heredity. So I am that. And at the same time, I am a rabid anti-racist racial justice warrior. And those two, you know, are are hand in hand and, and work together. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And and for people who would never say I'm racist, could you define being, can you, could you define the word racist oh, in any way? I would love to. Thank you for asking that. Yes, because um, that's a word that gets us all in so much trouble. And mainly because in, in the past and still in the mainstream, racist is usually understood to mean an individual who is individually um, uh, mean, uh, individually prejudiced and mean towards people of another race. And it turns out that that's not really what it means and it's not a helpful definition. So a racist, well, let me say, racism is the system of oppression of people of color by white people. That's what racism is. And some, some white folks are gonna immediately get head up that, wait a minute, everybody can be racist. My you know, black friend down the block doesn't like my Mexican friend or something. But so, yes, it is true that all people can have prejudices against someone of another race, but not all people are in the position of the folks who are at the top of a system. It's really important to just understand that it's a system of oppression that affects every institution, every organization, every aspect of life. Um, so, so racism benefits white people at the expense of people of color. Is it the fault of individual white people? Are all white people um, so prejudiced that they don't like folks of color? Are all white people guilty of you know, doing racist actions? Not necessarily, but the system is in place. So when I said racist a moment ago, when I defined myself as racist, what I mean is that I am a person in that oppressor group. I'm a white person. So even if I have the best heart and mind and soul in the world, I'm still part of that group that gets the privileges, the power and the resources. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I'm just gonna repeat and underscore what you said. I'm still part of the group that gets the privilege, the power and the resources that I inherit this Mm -hmm. known or unknown, aware yes. of or not aware of, by the simple and mere fact that I have access to things given the structure of what it is to have 
as I said, what Resma Menachem called white body supremacy, mm -hmm. that I have inherited this and it puts me in a position of greater power and privilege and access that other folks who have other skin colors don't have in this system, in this structure. Yes. Now, people will say, well, gee, I am a white, poor man in West Virginia, and this person is a black billionaire media mogul. And those things are true. And they also, it's also true, meaning that that person doesn't feel very empowered in West Virginia, right? They're not feeling like they're at the top of the heap of anything right now. Right. right. Um, but the one thing is, is that if you give that person a shower and a haircut and opportunity, that there is that a possibility to, um, to enter into that system and sort of, you know, move within it in a way that, um, a person of color, I'm just thinking of Oprah Winfrey right now. I think she was stopped in Hermes when she was, you know, shopping for a pocketbook or something um, when she yeah. was in Europe uh, by nature of the color of their skin. Yes. There's so many stories like Oprah's story that help to make this point clear. And, um, and, I, and yes, it's important to acknowledge that nobody has one status. Nobody is just their race, right? Everybody has multiple statuses and roles in society and some of them are privileged statuses or roles and some of them are oppressed so so yes everybody has that mix no denying that's an important piece of the puzzle um, but coming back to um, that that white people are the possessors of the privilege and power and resources i just thought of another um, story along those lines that henry Louis gates who's a world-renowned black scholar, author. Um, he was um, stopped entering his own home by police who thought he was a burglar breaking in. So, you know, that kind of just, I mean, that's such a simple example, but that's daily experience for people of color that wouldn't happen to a white person, even if you are poor, uneducated, various other statuses that- like, right. And, and, and two more things are coming up for me that I just want to name and then we can get, dig into a little bit more about what the class is about is one, um, and it can be a lot, a lot worse than that, right? Police involved shootings and, and, sure. and things like that when it comes to um, men and women of color, um, incarceration rates, um, you know, different kinds of systemic oppression when it comes to redlining and mortgages and, you know, different kinds of voter suppression and gerrymandering. I mean, the personal is political in so far as that, um, we're really talking about structural issues as they're manifested um, in individual instances. And I think that's really the, the main takeaway is that collectivist cultures, a lot of cultures that have to do with community, which is really the mindfulness teaching of like, well, we are interdependent, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, we are connected. There is no separation. We are both and this individual body that's unique and also this great collective that necessarily is dependent on one another. Um, that, that that philosophy, that way of being, that understanding, that knowing, that embodiment is cut off in order to be a part of this. Well, I'm separate. My, you know, sort of rugged individualism kind of mindset, which is um, part of that structurally um, violent um, way of being. And how do we move into a place of being more loving? And sometimes I think we have to walk through these sort of messy portals um, doing some of this work, but that you said at the end of the class, they come out feeling like empowered in a way, but more connected and more grounded and more connected to themselves. Yes, yes. Uh, my own experience again um, is, uh, and I almost always start there and then I look around to see, well, how is everybody else doing? <laughs> and if yeah. I see that, mm, yeah, I see that happening over there too, then I start to make it more of a generalization. Um, white people have had to numb ourselves. You know, we could not be the oppressors if we could feel, if we could be fully human. We yeah. could not do what we do. And you begin to thaw when you have that space to acknowledge what's happened, what's been done, uh, how you yourself were or were not complicit. That's when you begin to be able to 
I don't know, have the safety and the, and the freedom and the compassion from others to unfreeze and right. begin to come back to life. Right, right. And, and I love that because, again, as a trauma practitioner, a lot of the things that I see, trauma healing practitioner, is, um, is that kind of freeze or that kind of fight or that need to be right or on top. And I just want to circle back to the other thing that I wanted to name was the piece around like social location and um, positionality and intersectionality, which are terms that people may want to sort of be familiar with around. Um, well, I'll let you explain them because you know what they are. People have heard enough from me. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm enjoying listening, but um, intersectionality, actually, a lot of people using that term right now do not know that it was invented by a black woman named Kimberly Crenshaw, and um, she developed that term, uh, oh, I forget, I think back in the 70s, I don't know, some, some decades ago. And when she created that term, it was to talk explicitly about the dilemma of black women. It was just, it was about that. It was about recognizing that women who are black have double oppression. They have, you know, sexism and racism both leveled at them at the same time. And that complicates their lives and experience uh, in a way that, say, a black man who has his male privilege at the same time that he's oppressed as a, as a black person, he does at least have some, some privilege balancing that. So she came up with the term for that specific case. Over time, it has broadened out, and I am told that Kimberly Crenshaw has said, okay, that's all right, um, it can be broader. So now it, it does tend to mean kind of any meeting of different statuses. And like I was saying earlier, you can be oppressed in some of your uh, identities and at the same time privileged in other identities. So right. that's called intersectionality. Yeah, beautiful. And, it, and again, that intersectionality for me is like a Haitian, Dominican, Italian, American woman so that I have, um, you know, this sort of multiracial, multiethnic background and can be known as a woman of color with light skin privilege, right? And mm -hmm. so there's both the and there. Mm -hmm. there's, so I have inherited... Um, some of the burden and also some of the benefit of that structural system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's just how I've come to understand myself in the mm -hmm. way of being socially located. Social location um, is more around the idea of we were talking about earlier. Well, if you're white, if you're an English speaker, if you're part of a dominant religion, if you're able-bodied, if you're cis cisgendered, which means you're sex is your biological sex is the sex that you identify with and present um, yeah. now and you're, you're you know you're heterosexual and all these other things that those put you more in the center again you're talking about decentering whiteness but those would be in the center of the position of power and privilege in this structure in this system and that those who are queer and are black or are you know asian or are you know um whatever it is differently abled or differently abled yeah. are that's where the term marginalization comes because mm -hmm. it's pushed to the margins of and because of that the access the resources um is harder to to have have access to i just noticed that one of the other humans in my house is uh, rambling around <laughs> um folks are home because they're not at work or school so um, yeah. Just, well, I'm not noticing that. But even then, again, showing our interconnection because we are both and all and each one of us currently in this midst of this pandemic. And so, um, you know, people who are infected with this virus range from a libertarian like Rand Paul to, you know, um, this woman who just passed away, who's a 36 year old principal of a uh, Brooklyn high school for high school dropouts. And, um, you know, this is a real thing that affects us. And that's another thing about trauma. And you talked about the severity of the ways in which people who've inherited white skin privilege um, and whatever else is in that invisible backpack, which we could talk a little bit more about that. You could explain that in the way that you did Kimberly Crenshaw's um, piece. Um, but that, that there's this big trauma right? That, that we're, we're all facing this big challenge right now. And in a way, the inverse of the trauma of it is what it's showing us that this is something that can affect and does affect and will affect everyone. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sorry, a little bit lost the thread when there was a distraction. What, what could I talk about right now that would make sense? Well, that's okay. I think that that was what brought me to that which was that because there are people at home, because of the pandemic, because they're very much a part of what's happening here in the sense that, you know, whether you're distracted or not, or present or not, or whether or not we're talking about, you know, one thing or, or something else, that it's okay that there are other beings in your midst. Mm -hmm. And it's okay that we can acknowledge their presence in much the same way that doing that doesn't make it right or wrong or good or bad or one way or the other, in much the same way that doing this decentering whiteness work doesn't automatically you know, take away um, anything from from anyone. It adds to our awareness and what's in our field of vision and embodiment about how we are able to move around in the world and come from a less reactive and a more responsive and a more embodied place so that we connect with our neighbors who are increasingly multiracial or multi-ethnic or of other ethnicities. So um, I wanted to pull together a few pieces that came together right there that... Um, uh, given that, uh, if I'm right, uh, white people often tend to be numb in a profound way and also uh, have a sense of hollowness or fraud, being a fraud. Um, and given that we are getting the goodies and the privileges and the resources, what is there to impel us to decenter whiteness? Because that numbness causes us not to feel our own pain of you know how our humanity has been chopped. <laughs> um, so that's not going to be a motivator. And we're getting the goodies, uh, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. Um, we we are. Uh, so you know again. So what's gonna What's going to cause us to say, oh, yeah, I want to go and knock all that down <laughs> and decenter whiteness. So I think that that's where um, it comes back to the interconnectedness. Uh, you know, for sure, a lot of people that we see in anti-racist circles came there initially because they had close relationships with people of color. And, you know, in those in the course of those relationships, they finally realized, wait a minute, you know, I, I have these uh, conditioned attitudes and thoughts and feelings about my friend of color that I don't want and I don't like, and I need to do something about that. And I need to change these uh, reactions that I have that cause me to say and do things that other people come back and say, hey, that was pretty racist when you said that. So, so those connections are one of the things that um, can wake us up out of that stupor. And, um, and then as we're waking up, we start realizing um, how other cultures, other communities also have beauty and truth and wisdom that we have closed out, you know, shut off to. And that, wow, why wouldn't I want to you know, know and be all that I can. From and I, and I, I want to be culture. careful right there. And suddenly the word cultural appropriation or the term flashes. So I, I'm not talking about that. Okay. I'm not talking about, okay, let's go steal some cool, you know, spiritual exercises from the natives. Uh, that's not what I mean. But, but, you know, just that awareness of so much that is available to humanity that white culture has shut out. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. And I know what you were saying about cultural appropriation, which for those who don't know, again, the term would be about co-opting, um, you know, a particular family that's a reality TV show family comes to mind, um, is, is, is plucking things that would be part of black culture, whether it's cornrows or whether it's um, a certain body type or whether it's a certain, um, you know, uh, manicure or whatever it is, and popularizing those through the white lens. And, um, but not having that as an origin of um, one's own history and also not asking permission. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a way to be relational around um, sharing culture, but how that's different from stealing culture and then um, getting the financial benefit of someone and some other cultures, uh, creativity and deep practice that, um, 
one is using, but hasn't cultivated for the millennia that it usually takes to have that creative fomentation of whatever it is that was brought to the fore. Because as you say, it's been discarded, it's been cut off. And that's the sadness. And that's where the compassion comes in. Yeah. I'm just thinking as you're speaking about that, again, um, about the, the European roots and the, the losses there, you know, the, where a white person goes looking for some uh, resource from another culture because well, we, we discarded our resource that we had. Um, yeah. And some of them can be reclaimed and refound. And I think that that's part of the work that's being invited to be done at a lot of levels, you know, is what is ceremony? Where are our ceremonies? What are our roots? And everything here to me, as we've turned sort of, you know, civilians and, and civic minded folks into consumers where we have to buy things that represent some kind of um, symbolic um, meaning of a, a life passage going forward or something. But the, but the spirit of it is kind of, less about what it really means like a gender reveal party I don't know what that's about you know what I mean like I don't I mean sure I guess maybe uh -oh. but... <laughs> I, this is a literacy moment I haven't actually heard of one of those <laughs> well it's like a prom -posal. it's like I need to videotape the proposal to my prom date so that it's a big oh. thing and it oh. goes it goes quite literally goes viral on the internet or, you know, a gender reveal party. It's like a Jack and Jill's shower or like a, a wedding, you know, engagement kind of a party and things. And, and, and my point about that isn't to say that we can't have ceremony. It's that what are we doing it for and what is it really about? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and is it really connective? Mm -hmm. And does it go back to the roots of something or is it to just kind of make a display and how hollow to use your terminology that that display ultimately can be over time when it isn't rooted to use my terminology into something that is deeper and earthier and um, has some kind of a meaning behind it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. This is probably going to sound like a non sequitur, but I keep uh, wanting to go back to what you said earlier uh, when I gave the example of Henry Louis Gates yeah. and you again brought up about systemic and I just wanted to <laughs> kind of circle back there because um, that was such an important thing that you said that it, it is a, um, a mistake that we so often in thinking about race and racism, we tend to focus on individuals. You know, that's exactly what I was saying about the definition of racism, that the, the, older outmoded but still mainstream definition thinks of it as a personal failing or you know a personal way of being and doing but the reality is and and, and there is that you know that does exist obviously um, but um, what what for the most part communities of color are asking us to deal with is the systemic racism so I appreciate that when I gave the example of an individual you reminded us that you know, it's important for us to be aware of and deal with systemic oppression. Right. And I mean, if we're looking at structural issues and systemic issues and historical issues and all of that, we're looking at that, which is what we would call imprinting or what we would call conditioning or what we would call, you know, all these things that contribute to the unconscious. If you're using psychological language or Freudian language or, you know, the implicit, the things that are underneath us that, you know, we, we that, are, that are operative regardless of whether or not we see them or not, you know. Um, and so the whole point about a mindfulness practice is to, to make visible, to bring forward, to allow, and to have the space of awareness, to trust and surrender, if you will, um, and, and to this larger consciousness and this larger body, that it isn't just yours to hold. It's painful mm -hmm. to be contracted mm -hmm. in this rigid place of having to be supreme mm -hmm. or better than. Mm -hmm. And many of us just get stuck on the less than. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we're stuck there. We're still in the hierarchy, though. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. So, so we get our place in the hierarchy, but we're we're squarely on the bottom. But we feel okay there, even in our not okayness, because we're at least in the hierarchy. Right. Because we have something there. Whereas if you if you let it go, and you open to this other place of connection, mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's dukkha and sukha, suffering and happiness, right? There's these mm-hmm. two places. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to be happy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Suffering is a fact of life, but we don't need to add the supremacy piece. So people are going to get sick or people are going to die. I mean, that's just the way it is, but we don't need to add the extra piece of the narrative of, well, now I'm a bad person because I didn't realize I was racist. No, it's just you were conditioned. And now can we do the work? This is the invitation. Yeah, that, that is definitely a, a, a danger here of, of uh, white people now blaming themselves and becoming paralyzed and guilt-ridden and, you know, just all kinds of very unhelpful, dysfunctional things. That is not what racial justice and equity work is about. And honestly, um, it's partly kind of recentering myself as a white person. If I get all caught up in, oh God, I feel so bad about you know my ancestors who enslaved people. I'm not actually technically aware that any of mine did, but I don't know. Um, but you know, they, they did other stuff if they didn't do that. And um, and I now myself do things. You know, every day I do things or or am part of something that is oppressive. So I can choose to, you know, spend a lot of time just, you know, being really feeling bad about that and so on. And that is just so unhelpful. You know, Robin, as I'm listening to you talk, one of the things that comes to mind is a few years ago when I started doing some of this work, you know, the, the, one of the things that we read is the invisible backpack, which I'd like you to talk a little bit about. And then Mm -hmm. also about allyship and partnership and what those things mean because I feel as though the reason why, and the research has proven it time and time again, that diversity and inclusion efforts at a corporate or a nonprofit level haven't really lived up to whatever they said that they might want to be or do. And I, my argument for that is, my theory is that it's because it's not embodied. Mm. It's been that I'm doing something to sort of, within this system mm-hmm. that's structured around, well, this percentage of people of this skin color and this mm-hmm. percentage of people of that mm-hmm. in this category of hierarchy at the C level suite or C suite level versus the managerial versus the worker B level that, that, that the very frame of that like kind of makes no sense. Um, but that the embodiment comes from doing this work and then out of doing this work of realizing, of really realizing, it's really a realization, an awakening, like when Buddha touched the earth and the ground shook and it was like, no, I witness you. I get it. I feel it. Like you got it. You woke up like you're there. Mm -hmm. Mother earth did that. Yeah. That, that that's different than trying to do diversity inclusion efforts. And that's why the social location work about where am I in this system? Do I even know that I'm a fish in this water mm-hmm. is so important. And from that place, one can then go about doing work with and as a fellow human and not to or for another group of people. Yes. Yes. Um, I have to admit you're, you're touching on one of the, um, conflicts that I experience as a racial justice trainer and educator, which is between, on the one hand, the um, argument for systemic anti-racism training, you know, like mandated professional days and that kind of thing. So that's that's something that uh, we do in the racial justice uh, community. And then on the other hand, a webinar such as we're offering next month where people, you know, freely choose for themselves to come as an individual. And, um, you know, I, honestly, I, I think that it's probably more effective when an individual says, you know, I'm going to go do this. Um, I'm going to put myself in this situation. I'm, I'm open at least a little bit to learning and growing as opposed to when, the the uh, you know the bosses on high say oh you got to be here on Saturday your day off and you got to be here all day blah blah, blah. Um, and at the same time there's a part of me that feels like it should be mandatory everybody in the society is so messed up we need serious anti racism training um, yeah but there has to be buy in right. And I think that's the difference is my experiences, which is so surprising to people who are in privileged, um, you know, skin bodies, lighter white skin, privileged bodies that haven't really kind of started to do this work, but then start to do it. 
my direct experience, even as recently as four days ago, <clears throat> three days ago, with a, <clears throat> excuse me, white British man in a sort of quasi, you know, meditative spiritual um, practice, um, we walked through this process of, and, and the shift happened. Mm. Mm. And with that was shame and tears mm. and overwhelm and then connection and mm. embodiment. And I swear he got two feet taller Wow! and he softened and he became like real. Isn't that the mm -hmm. Velveteen Rabbit? Mm. You know? Yeah. And it was so yeah, really beautiful real. and connective. And I knew we were doing healing ancestry work together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just us. Mm -hmm. And this conversation is just an extension of that. Mm -hmm. But to witness that, to be a part of that, to be, that was his embodiment. I'm not worried about him. He's going to go off and do everything from that place. And that place is the rooted place. That's not the, I'm trying to do something place. Mm -hmm. That's the place of the knowing place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that that place is um, something that a, an individual can only bring themselves to. Like there's not a way to bring someone else there, although we can certainly, you know, provide supportive environment and webinars and resources and so on. But it does seem to me that there, there is that point when you uh, get it, to use some yes. old language. And before you get it, then it doesn't matter what experiences you have, what arguments you have, you know, you've got it in your head how things are, and you can make everything match that concept. And after you get it, then all of a sudden, a lot of those rationales and explanations and frameworks fall apart. And that's, you know, that very messy time, which maybe never ends of, oh, God, you know, I have a lot to learn here. And everything looks different and feels different. Yeah. And then as you say that, I'm reminded of like, you know, Sharon Salzberg, the mindfulness teacher always talks about, it's not what happens, it's how you relate to what happens. So then what is our attitude? And, and, and you know, we talk a lot in mindfulness circles about what's our deepest intention. So are we trying to get somewhere? Is it, are we attached to an outcome? Or are we committed to a way of being? Which mm. is, you know, and, 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 so, and, and so are we committed to walking that path of mm -hmm. anti-racist work? And if it's messy, it's messy, but it's fine because we can handle it or, you know, we're open to it or we know that we're going to survive it or, you know, and, and also knowing that like the people who are the ancestors of, you know, the people of color who are around us, black people in the United States, um, descendants of people who are enslaved, I mean, the they had it rough and often still do more so than a lot of folks in these um, lighter white skin privileged bodies that it doesn't mean one is better or worse or good or bad. We're not, we're not, you know, sort of saying that we're just saying, Hey, you have capacity. You have, you have a capability. Um, you can do this. Yes. I just have to mark the, the ancestors of the indigenous people who, we're here before as well. They're, they're also, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We're yeah. here sitting on Lenape land here in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. This is not the land of, of me, my, you know, my family is from Italy and from Haiti and before Haiti from Africa, from West Africa, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I think that that's really important. And I name that a lot. Um, although I didn't when I started this podcast, but it's worth noting that um, the Canarsie people, that the Lenape people, that they're still here. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and that they didn't give permission. Um, they worked in solidarity and in partnership, but uh, with, with, you know, folks who came and, and were kind of hoodwinked mm -hmm. and, um, you know, paying the price. And, and, and I think that working on doing our part to reconcile. Um, you know, they talk about in psychological circles, rupture and repair, you know, uh -huh. attachment disorders as your kid, like, you know, you have insecure attachment with your parents or your caregivers. And that the, the, the thing that builds trust isn't having everything be okay all the time, but the repair process. Mm 
Yeah. So after a rupture that there's repair. And this yeah. to me is the work of repair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I just want to, you know, say transparently that at the center, we are doing repair work around the fact that um, we have largely focused in the past on racism as a phenomenon between white people and black people. And there's various reasons for that, um, including some very practical ones, such as that our founders were a mixed race couple, married couple, a black woman and a white man. So that was kind of real for them, those issues between black and white people. Um, It's also historically in our country been very much where the focus has been and so on and so on. Um, But uh, coming forward to more recent time, uh, the center has been working harder to look at how, for instance, indigenous history is part of the work that we're doing and how does that need to be foregrounded in our workshops and programs and so on. And uh, it's very exciting to me because that's that's a whole other area that I don't know about. You know, we are so ignorant about so much um, in this country. Uh, you know, I didn't learn about uh, so-called Indian slavery in high school. I don't know if you did, but I sure didn't learn about it. And yet that was a huge phenomenon, the enslavement of indigenous people in this country. Uh, it, it kind of played out differently, I think, from the enslavement of black people, of people from Africa. Um, But it was, it was a reality and devastating, you know, Mm. to native communities. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're doing some catch up. Yeah. And and it's laudable that you're doing that. And also um, it's important. And, and, you know, I just completed a, a a year long complex trauma certification uh, in a modality called Indigenous Focusing Oriented Therapy um, Mm. that was created by an Indigenous Canadian woman and um, Jean Gendlin Focusing, um, which is a somatic uh, sort of approach toward um, the felt sense in the body and and what needs to come forward. Um, But anyway, that, um, you know, there are folks who've suffered residential schools. Um, <laughs> the word that came to mind was incarceration, not placement, um, yeah. but residential mm-hmm. schools placement, uh-huh. um, w- which is something that we won't learn, you know, we don't learn about, which uh, only ended a few decades ago, which was about, um, you know, people taking indigenous children from their homes and putting them in a very, uh, we're talking about rigid, one way, myopic kind of, you know, schooling uh, and and all of the abuses that took place there and uh, all the families that were ripped apart. And so there's a lot there, but part of what's so beautiful too about the training was the healing there and all Mm -hmm. of the ways in which we learned about plant medicine and we learned about ritual and we learned about, and we practiced it and that we're, given permission to practice it Uh and then we share it. Mm. So I guess in that vein, um, what's coming to mind for me now is what's happening with uh, the way in which uh, Asian Americans are being targeted in this country right now uh, because of the way in which this virus has affected um, people and the way that it's been blamed uh, a certain, you know, population Erroneously, so obviously. Yeah, yeah. I just saw a a headline on a paper I didn't have time to read, but I got it from the headline about how quickly the model minority became the virus carrier, you know, which is a result of that the model minority was never a healthy uh, relationship that white people had with Asian people in the first place. And, uh, you know, it shows when, oh, things go badly, then all of a sudden our model minority turns into the monster of the day. Well, that people, so the model minority, for those who aren't familiar with the term around um, Asian Americans being, you know, the immigrants who sort of just kind of came in and were, you know, very sort of assimilative in in ways that were non-threatening to Mm -hmm. um, the white structural systems. Uh, And that that Um, obviously has now turned into, you know, being scapegoated, Uh, meaning that there's, there's, 
as you know, even many of my clients are experiencing right now, a real sense of threat mm -hmm. in much the same way that um, you know, other people of color have been experiencing for a long time mm -hmm. that uh, may not have been as felt um, yeah. you know, prior for that reason. Well, sorry to hear that. Uh, yes, but again, the structural issues around that continue to persist. And because of the trauma response and the way that the ne evolutionary negativity bias, you know, sort of is where we're scanning for threat, we get locked into what Tarabra calls that limbic hijack. And when we're acting from that place of our lower brain stem, we are coming from a place of fight, flight, freeze, or fix, or fornicate, or whatever it is, fawn, you know, and what we do there is we tend to have that more, well, I need to, to, to just keep myself alive and keep myself safe. And, and if that means blaming someone else, then that's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't have to make sense. It just has to be something that keeps me on the team where I feel safer. And, right. and that's an evolutionary adaptation that homo sapiens sapiens, the one who are aware that we're aware, we've moved beyond that. We have the emotional brain where we feel scared, but then we have our prefrontal cortex, our neocortex to be able to process the feeling of being scared with the cognition around like, okay, well, what's really going on here? All right, I can handle this. We're going to be, you know, in this together, how we're going to move forward yeah. and how that's different. So anyway, yeah. and it's sort of a tangent, but well, not entirely. So I'll bring that back to our workshop and just our work generally uh, is that um, my experience, and again, watching others, I see that it's same for other people, is that the, the more we challenge that, what did you call it? The limbic? The limbic is the emotional response. Yeah. But you, you had a phrase, the limbic back track oh. or something. <laughs> oh, the limbic hijack. That's what Tara Brock calls hijack. it. Limbic yeah. hijack. I love that. I have to yeah. write that one down. Um, so, you know, that- We're caught. Yeah. So that's, that's going to happen, of course. But the more practice and experience that we have, especially in the company of other folks, in, you know, getting past that and having a healthy response to situation and being able to be creative and present in the moment, the, the easier that becomes, the stronger- we become, you know, I still get triggered so easily by racial events. I really do. I'm a very sensitive person and, uh, you know, a, just one little look or gesture or word and I'm set off. But I now have 20 years of experience bringing myself back to center and remembering that it's my racist conditioning that had that feeling come up when that black man entered the elevator with me to use a very familiar example you know and and so it it makes a difference when we keep doing the work and when we uh find allies i just remembered i think earlier you asked me to say something about allies so uh so yeah that is crucial uh you cannot go up against a system <laughs> like racism by yourself. And yet white people have been very much trained in that rugged individualism and independence. You know, I'm going to do this myself. That is not going to work. You are going to burn out and that is going to, you know, mean that your efforts were for nothing and you're, you're no good to the movement. So don't do that. Instead, surround yourself with partners, you know, find individuals, find organizations, find workshops to do, books to read, movies to watch, everything. But, you know, make connections in the racial justice community mm -hmm. so that the next time that limbic thing hits you, you've got resources and strength and resilience. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. The sangha of community around doing the racial equity work and the decentering whiteness work and the healing work, because, you know, we're not in alone, but that's why Ruth King, she's a Dharma teacher. And I also interviewed her for this podcast a long time ago. She wrote a book called Mindful of Race that I, rec I recommend everyone pick up. She recommends doing racial affinity groups, and that's being with people who are in your affinity group. And for me, that would be multiracial. It doesn't have to be Haitian and Dominican and Italian. Mm -hmm. Those would be hard to find, but it could be some other version of Jamaican and, you know, Japanese and, you know, uh, whatever, indigenous person or something, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so that 
white people come together and then they go through the exercises and they go through some of this work and have these conversations for a year and they meet once a month like a book club and three or groups of three or four to have conversations around this in a structured way that is comfortable supportive comfortable meaning <laughs> it's in a way that they're doing the work together and it's not just being an outlier having that and committed to doing it for a period of time for a year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of white affinity groups and I've, I've belonged to two, one of which I still belong to. It's a about 17 or 18 year old uh, group now of white Quakers. Um, and our group is a mixture of self work and activism. Uh, the other group I belonged to was for six or seven years, and it was explicitly for um, emotional um, repair. Mm. Um, and so both of those have shaped me a lot in my understanding of who I am as a white person, um, what my white community is about, what are our failings and weaknesses, what are our strengths and resources and resilience. It's been super important. But I know that a lot of times when you first bring up the topic of white affinity group, or they're also called caucus groups, people really freak out. Like sometimes they, they can get behind a black caucus group or a, a Puerto Rican, Italian um, mixed race. But when you say white caucus group, oh my God, you know, that evokes the Klan. And well, I think that a better frame or name for it might be interrogating whiteness. So I think that that's perhaps a better frame for it. So if we think about it in those terms, then we can just think about it in terms of either decentering whiteness or interrogating whiteness, meaning that the question or the invitation is around what is this construct? Mm -hmm. Who am I and what am I in this? Who have I been asked to be or made to be that mm -hmm. isn't authentically me? Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? Do I want to be here? Where's my choice points here? What can I do differently? What's the cost to me doing different? Mm. am I willing to do that? Is there a part of me that's afraid of what that looks like? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that that conversation is, is, I mean, naming means a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think social distancing is the right word. Physical distancing is the right oh, word. Oh, that's what our founder says too. Carly yeah. Flint, she's right. the black woman who founded us. And she says that too. <laughs> well, or geographic distancing in the sense that it's, mm -hmm. it's or, or location distancing or something. Yes. But again, I'm a, I'm a journalist, so terminology means a lot. Yeah. And, you know, those who get to decide the terms of the debate, you know, have more of the power. And so all I'm saying is, is let's reframe that, you know, physical distancing, yes. emotional connection. Yeah. 100%. Yes. And that's from Bruce Perry. I didn't invent that. Um, he's a trauma scientist, but... So as we close today, can you tell us a little bit of the takeaways um, for the class and also just maybe an anecdote or two about a personal example where you felt like I'm actually just more embodied and connected with a person of color in a way that after doing this work, like I'm not thinking or seeing them as this other person. If this has happened to you, I'm not saying that it is, but I'm, I'm thinking that in your commitment to this work, it probably has been where it's just been that drop down connection. Yeah. Yeah. So um, takeaways about the class, um, we're doing a, I assume some of this information will be available. So I don't have to go through all the, it's all going to be on the website and they can okay. click away oh, and we're going to so. put it all in the podcast liner notes and everything, but <laughs> just, you know, okay. to give people a little bit more of a, of a, of a little quick takeout menu version. Yeah. Okay. So the, the course is called Decentering Whiteness and Building Multiracial Community. And what we want to do over the course of six hours, uh, it's three two-hour Zoom video conferences, what we want to do over that time is to uh, understand more about, well, what is whiteness, first of all, and then what does it mean and look like uh, for me and for us as a society to decenter whiteness and to build that anti-racist multiracial center? What's that going to take? Mm. What's it going to look like? What am I going to do? Um, so that's the point of the webinar. Six um, hours, folks. Six hours. Yeah. Oh, and all of it is video recorded. And I don't want to encourage people to not come live because it's much more engaging when you are there 
you know, in person and able to take part in the small and large group discussions, ask your questions, share your views, and so on. Much more engaging. However, we know that people have busy lives, so we do video record all of it. And if you have to miss a portion, you can watch the movie later. Mm -hmm. so that's an option. And your own personal examples of really just feeling like you're you're meeting folks, you know, sort of in a different place. I'm sure it's not like all the time because that's just not how the, any of this goes. But experiences where had you not done some of this work yourself, then you wouldn't ever have gotten to. Um, let's see. The first example that comes to mind, I hope I'm going to be able to remember an important detail about it. It was a few years back, but I was in a mixed race training program. It was actually a trainer for trainers um, for folks who do racial justice work. And um, there was a black woman who I had gotten to know a little bit in the course of the weekend. And um, she at one point objected to a concept that I brought up. And that's the one where I'm not going to be, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to remember now what was the concept. Um, maybe it doesn't matter. She, um, kind of, she pushed back on a concept that I raised. And I went away and thought about that really hard because when, when a person of color, especially someone who I know has a, a strong grounding in anti-racism, um, comes to me and says, uh, you're off about that, I'm gonna listen. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that we, we were a little bit missing each other, that there was truth in what I had put out there and there was truth in what she had put out there and they were kind of missing each other. And so then I went through this big struggle about, well, but if I go back and try to have another conversation with her, will she feel, you know, insulted um, and like, okay, you, you know, you're just another white person who doesn't listen. And I really struggled with what's the right way to go about this. And in the end, I decided, okay, I'm going to take what feels to me like a big risk and I'm going to approach her again. This is somebody I barely know. And so I did. And I asked her, would it be okay if I come back to that conversation we had the other day, would that be all right with you? And I was very open, very clear that I really was asking, is this okay? And she said, mm, all right. And so I you know, put out my thought about how this thing was a little more complex and she listened and she acknowledged that, oh, okay, yes, that's, an, so I don't know, but we ended up having an amazing conversation. Um, where I believe that we both felt heard and understood and um, we parted friends. Mm, mm, beautiful. Yeah. So rather than just leave it where there was a misunderstanding, there was some courage, it sounds like, to come through to say, not from a place of arrogance or being right or wanting to get your point across, but that we're missing each other. There was a misunderstanding and that there was sort of a, something in the way of, of us connecting. And you wanted to find what that obstacle was and see if it couldn't be cleared so that you could be connected. Yeah, yeah beautiful. So, yeah. you know, again, that's sort of the name of the game here, building multiracial community. And I remember when I was in high school, <clears throat> I think I graduated like second in my class or something. And so I had to give a, a, a speech or something. And I don't really remember... Um, much about it other than that it was about community and that I just remembered that um, my theme there was that um, well community is need-based it's necessarily interdependent a real community is about sort of I lean on you in a way that is different from the way that the next person leans on me but that we're all kind of leaning on one another in a way and and I think that that's what's really being borne out now, where we're seeing the child care workers, the elder care workers, the people who are doing food delivery, the people who are, you know, still providing transportation right now in the midst of this pandemic, that those folks are tending to be the people who are not white collar workers. The people who are white collar workers tend to be working at home. And often those white collar workers, to use that term, are white, are in the dominant class or privileged or whatever it is that you want to say. And the people who are really doing, once again, the heavy lifting, the labor, putting their lives on the line, are our brothers and sisters. So we are interdependent, whether or not we think these folks are in, 
invisible in our regular day-to-day -day lives. We don't have to do anything other than tip them or pay them. They're not a them. They're in us. Yeah. We are a them to them. Yeah. And they are a them to us. Yes. And so I just think that this opportunity that we have here, um, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, is also an opportunity for awakening about these very issues because they're structural issues, they're economic issues, they're issues around um, the haves and the have-nots and sharing. Can we not share? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we learned this since, you know, when we were three in the sandbox. That's right. <laughs> you know. That's right. Yep. <laughs> we definitely got taught to share. So, um, Yeah. Well, my dear, um, Robin, uh, I just want to say thank you once again for uh, your time today. Uh, Robin Mallison Alpern, the Director of Training at uh, the Center for the Study of White American Culture, again, about interrogating the concept of whiteness and what it means culturally, not a white supremacist organization. <laughs> just underscoring that one more time. And um, the new class is Decentering Whiteness and Building Multiracial Community, and it starts... Uh, very soon. It starts, uh, I think, in a week or two, and we'll post all the links to that. So thank you so much for joining us on Rerooted. Um, we appreciate your time and your commitment to doing this work. Thank you again for having me, Francesca, and thanks for all the work that you're doing. Keep it up. All right. Take care. All right.